morning. Welcome to Christ the King on Christ the King Sunday. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear where our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest on the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things, and your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. A reading from Daniel, chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousands served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body was destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came like one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. <coughs> The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 93, beginning with verse 1. We will read the verse responsibly, by, we will read the psalm responsibly by a whole verse. I will begin. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He is <coughs> The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the heavens and the earth. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord our God is mighty. 
Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. A reading from Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel and to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The Gospel of the Lord. May we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be accepted in the sight of the Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, today is Christ the King Sunday, the end of the season of Pentecost. Next week, Advent begins, and of course, hard on the heels of Advent is Christmas. We heard in the scripture readings today that Jesus has come to establish an everlasting kingdom, which he has. The prophecy of Daniel is fulfilled in Christ, and then in Revelation we see what's going to happen at the end of time itself when Jesus returns to be the judge and the, the new heavens and new earth will be established. He is the Alpha and the Omega who is and who was and who is to come. In the gospel passage today, however, we have an interesting case study and a contrast between the differences between two kingdoms. A kingdom of the world represented by 
the Roman Empire and Pontius Pilate, the governor, and Jesus, the king of God's kingdom. And I think what we find in this passage, and I, I do believe we find in this passage, is that Jesus is a different kind of king for a different kind of kingdom. God's kingdom is unlike the kingdoms of the world, which we find in this passage, which we'll look at in John chapter 18. And if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, that's page 904, 904 in the Pew Bibles. What we find is that a, an earthly king uses power to enforce his will in this territory. Military power, legal power, an earthly king has the ability to get his way without any kind of appeal. To set the scene that we have in John 18, Jesus has been arrested. He's already been to see the high priests. He's been before the uh, Sanhedrin, and they uh, have uh, what they wanted was a, a charge of blasphemy against him, but uh, something esoteric and uh, of a religious nature isn't going to make an appeal to Pontius Pilate, as he says in this passage, am I a Jew? Do I really care about the intricacies of your religion? I'm a Roman. But what he does care about is making sure that Roman rule is not opposed by uppity subject people in a place like Jerusalem. And if there is a problem... Romans crush rebels and rebellion. That's why the religious leaders go to Pilate and say, hey, this guy is claiming to be king of the Jews. And if, there are, if he's claiming to be king of the Jews, what's he going to do? He's going to come after you, Pilate. And that's bad for you and for Rome. And you've got to do something about it. And so that's the, the, the background uh, of where we're at in this passage in chapter 18, uh, where Pilate uh, has entered his headquarters and calls Jesus, who's now a prisoner, and says, uh, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answers, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Because that's a, a pragmatic response, isn't it? I mean, why are you here? This is early in the morning, the morning of Christ's crucifixion. They didn't have, uh, you know, an appeal court system like we have today where you're charged, found guilty, and then you go to another level, and then you go to another level, and then eventually you go to the Supreme Court. It takes years and years and years. Uh, back in the day, uh, they, they uh, rendered a verdict and the, the sentence was carried out immediately. So this is the, the morning of Christ's crucifixion. But here we have this uh, exchange between Pilate and Jesus. Uh, and Jesus says, uh, my kingdom is not of this world, verse 36. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And he says again, but my kingdom is not uh, from this world. So Jesus is making a distinction that a kingdom like that of Pontius Pilate, and he represents Tiberius Caesar, is founded on military power. Jesus is arrested and taken to Pilate's palace, which is part of a military compound full of crack Roman soldiers. And there's lots of them. Why? because this was a trouble spot in the Roman Empire. And Rome made sure to, ass to assert authority right in the heart of the Jewish capital. They weren't outside in an encampment. They were right in the city. And they took over some prime real estate to make sure that they were there to quell any disturbance in those very narrow streets of the old city. Pilate was able to exercise absolute authority 
on Caesar's behalf because he had the backing of an army. And Jesus is saying, my kingdom isn't like that. It's not founded on military power or coercive power. The foundation of God's kingdom is on a different basis, as we'll see in a moment. Otherwise, Jesus says, his servants would have taken up arms and done something about it. His servants would have been ready to do something. And so what Jesus is doing is making a claim that his kingdom is different, but also uh, that he himself is not going to be a threat to Roman rule, which as a rather touchy governor, Pilate must have been wiping his forehead because Jesus isn't going to be like Barabbas. We encounter him at the end of this passage, Barabbas. Now, who is he? It says at the, in verse 40 that he's a robber. Another translation for robber is insurrectionist, and that's probably more appropriate for the context here because Barabbas wasn't uh, arrested for stealing a bunch of apples in the, the market or stealing a bunch of apples from the apple store. You know, he wasn't being convicted uh, and being tried for being a thief. He was there as a state prisoner because he was leading an insurrection against the Romans, and he was slated to die along with two of his collaborators on a cross in a public execution to make sure everyone understood that don't trifle with Rome. Don't trifle with Rome. Don't even think of doing anything against Roman rule. Otherwise, well, we will kill you. And they were serious. Barabbas was like that. He was sentenced to die, but Jesus is saying, I'm not like Barabbas. I'm not a threat because my kingdom is not like an earthly kingdom or uh, anything that was in existence at that time. So there's a difference between the, the power of an earthly king founded on coercive power, military power, and a kingdom that Jesus is bringing into effect. Now, Jesus does acknowledge that he is a king. In verse 37, when Pilate says, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. But what we find is that Christ the king has a different purpose than coercing people or lording it over people or forcing them to do things against their will, like pay their taxes and do other things that they weren't willing to do and didn't want to do. What we find is that Christ the King wants to welcome people into his kingdom by invitation. Christ the King offers people an invitation to be part of his kingdom by an invitation, by meeting them where they are, by acknowledging what's going on in their lives and responding to that. And we find I, that I believe in this passage. Jesus says to Pilate, for this purpose I was born to be a king, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus is a king, but he's a different kind of king. And I believe he, he's trying to meet Pilate at a level for response from Pilate. And this is what I mean. We find several intriguing accounts in this gospel of Jesus meeting people one-on-one -on -one and having a conversation with them. In John chapter 3, Jesus has a conversation of a scared scholar who comes to see Jesus at night. Nicodemus doesn't want his colleagues to see him around this strange religious leader that the, the authorities are unsure at the beginning of what he's all about, but he really can't 
be up to any good because if, if he were, he would have been one of those scholars in Jerusalem who'd been to Harvard and to Yale, not uh, from some hick town uh, in Galilee, right? Because all the beautiful people live in Jerusalem, all the rubes live up in the north. And so, but Nicodemus was intrigued, and I believe that the button that, that Jesus is able to push and respond to is, how do you know God at a deep level? And what Jesus says to Nicodemus is that you must have a spiritual rebirth, you must be born again to know God. And th there's something else that Nicodemus needed to understand, that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture, that he is the one to make us right by God by being the, the suffering servant of, of Isaiah who came to die to atone for the people's sins. And he unpacks that for Nicodemus in chapter 3. In chapter 4, Jesus meets with a woman at the well, a woman who was there at noon in the middle of the day. And, you know, here in the summer, noon is pretty hot. Well, it's the same uh, in the Middle East. And she's despised, she's rejected, she's an outcast, and that's why she's all by herself. And Jesus comes to tell her, to sit with her, a Jew talking to a Samaritan, a foreigner, about the love of the Messiah for her. That the Messiah has come for her because he cares for her, and she is so excited. She goes into the village, she doesn't care anymore about the stigma that she believes she had, and, and she goes and tells people, hey, hey, th this is the one. Could, could this be the Messiah? Come, come, come and see, come and see, come and see. And, and the people from the town come, and, and, and there's Jesus there by the well, and, and they come to learn of the Messiah. And I believe that, that here in this passage, Jesus is opening an invitation for Pilate to know something that, Pilate has been inquiring about. Now, this is a bit sp of speculation, but it's interesting to look at the language of Jesus. And Jesus, as we discover in Scripture, doesn't ask about the weather. He isn't engaging in small talk, is he, with people in Scripture. He, he gets to the heart of people because, being God, he knows what's going on in people's lives. And he's not guessing. He knows. And here... It's interesting what Jesus says to Pilate, being a highly educated Roman. You had to be educated to be a governor. That, you were only selected from uh, an uh, elite group to be a governor of a Roman territory. Okay, And so listen to the language that Jesus uses. I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. He repeats truth twice. Why? Because Roman statesmen were interested in things like truth. They were interested in ethics and how a king rules. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the great Greek philosophers that the Romans absolutely loved, dealt with issues like that. What is the good life? How does a moral person live? How do we know what is true? How do we know what is good? I believe that Jesus is touching on an area that Pilate, as a younger person, probably was considering and debated, as the Greeks loved to do, about things like truth. What is truth? Back and forth. That's the way dialogue and argument in the sense of just stating positions and going back and forth worked in the ancient world, and they loved it and they, because they were inquirers. They were interested in these topics. And what Jesus is saying here is that truth itself isn't just a concept. Truth is found in a person, the person who is speaking to Pilate. The person speaking to Pilate is claiming that he is truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So truth is not an abstract concept. Truth is a person, Jesus is saying. And I think what he was doing was trying to invite Pilate into a conversation about the nature of truth and what Jesus had just said about truth. 
as the Greeks and Romans did. Let's have a dialogue. Dialogue being conversation with two people. As he did with Nicodemus, and he did with the woman at the well. Pilate's response is interesting. He heard part of what Jesus is talking about with truth, didn't he? Because he said, what is truth? He heard that part. But what he does is dismiss and close down any conversation with Jesus about the nature of truth. Why? He's a governor. He's a busy man. The cares and the concerns of running this little area of the Roman Empire consume Pilate and his time and his energy. Let's get on with things, shall we? He doesn't find any fault with Jesus, but he doesn't have any time for a conversation about truth. Isn't that the way of the world? That we don't have the time or the energy or the inclination to open up our, our hearts to inquire about truth, especially when we leave college. That ship has sailed. We consider those, those questions as an undergraduate. Now you've got to live life. Now you've got to get on with making money. You've got to raise your family. You've got to do all these things, and you don't have time to consider a question like truth or what is true or things like that when you've got things to do. And yet Jesus still opens that door for any inquirer who wants to listen to what he has to say about himself and the nature of truth. That in God, we have truth itself and himself. Not only what he, in what he says, but in what God has done for us in Christ, being our Lord and Savior, the one who is going in a few hours from this interview with Pilate to be crucified for our sake. What we find in this part is that Jesus looks for people to invite into a conversation to reveal to any inquirer with an open mind and an open heart the truth of who he really is and what he came to achieve when he came to earth and to die on the cross. He invites all people to consider him as king, to be the king over our lives. And the last difference I see between king and kingship in this passage is that an earthly king like Caesar or his representative like Pilate is above his people. The people serve the king. Christ has come to be among the people to serve them. Christ came to serve them and to serve us. And we ultimately see that in the fact that he died. Jesus, in another passage, in Mark 10, describes his purpose for coming. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus died a brutal death on the cross full of unbelievable pain and suffering, more than we have, we have ever experienced, because he gave up kingliness. Caesar wouldn't do that, would he? Or any earthly king. They don't give up their kingliness to become a servant. And Jesus does something that no earthly king could do to die in our place. And this is the, the real difference between an earthly king and Jesus as king. Christ dies for us. And the role of serving and loving are part of the truth of God's kingdom in a way that can never be in an earthly kingdom an earthly king really doesn't care that much about you as long as they get the money at the end of the year and you do what you're told. Jesus is a king who does care. 
and continues to call his people to respond to his loving rule, to trust the gospel, to place our ultimate hope not in transitory kingdoms like that of Rome that do fade away or destroyed, but in the promise of the King of kings and Lord of lords whose promises will never fade away and have been established 2,000 years ago and continue to this day. On Christ the King Sunday, we see Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords over an eternal kingdom. In the passage from John, we have a contrast between two concepts of kingship and kingdoms. Jesus is a different kind of king in a different kind of kingdom. He doesn't use coercive military power to establish his reign, and he doesn't lord it over his people by using coercive force. Jesus as king invites his people into his kingdom through love, th through meeting people where they are, by understanding that we're all different, but we still have an intrinsic need to know God's love, God's forgiveness, God's promise of eternal life found only in Christ and have to have meaning and purpose in our lives given to us as a gift by Christ. Jesus is the embodiment of the kingdom and God's kingdom that he came to earth to establish. And we're not servants like those of the world's kingdoms because we are Christ's brothers and sisters. Still, Jesus is a king. The words of the king are to be listened to because of the, the words of life and meaning and hope. And I believe he invites us at Christ the King Church to continue to have that purpose of life beyond ourselves. To look first to Christ as King and then look to the lives of others to serve them, to help them, to love them, to make a difference in their lives so that others who don't know Christ as King will know Christ the King. Amen. Please stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for, for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching, beseeching, thee, <clears throat> beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of unity, truth, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name 
May agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy. We beseech thee also so to lead the nations of the world into the way of righteousness, and so to direct and dispose the hearts of all our leaders, especially Joe Biden, our president, and Michelle Lujan Grisham, our governor, that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may truly and impartially administer justice, upholding integrity and truth, to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Lord, in thy mercy, give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servant Foley, our Archbishop. Stephen, our bishop, Pete, our priest, and Bill, our deacon, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, They may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. Prosper, we pray thee, all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations, and strengthen us to fulfill thy great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all thou hast commanded. Lord, in thy mercy, we give thanks for our missionaries, especially Jean Johnson, a crew ministry missionary in inner city Denver, working with youth and young adults. CareNet, a ministry devoted to protecting the lives of the most vulnerable. Child evangelism, evangelism, fellowship dedicated to the sharing of the gospel with kids in after school and church-based programs. Give them, O Lord, and give them boldness to serve you. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. And we most humbly beseech thee in thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in the transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Hope, Kelly, Max, Malcolm, Paula, Bill, Mike, Gina, and others we now name before you. Lord, in thy mercy, we remember before thee, O Lord, all thy servants who have departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Melody Ripley, that will that thy will for them may be fulfilled. And we beseech thee to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of their heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. O oh God, our heavenly Father, by your Son, Jesus Christ, You have promised to those who seek your kingdom and its righteousness all things necessary to sustain their life. Send us, we pray, in this time of need such moderate rain and showers that we may receive the fruits of the earth to our comfort and to your honor, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in thy mercy, grant these our prayers, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one world without end. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God 
devoutly kneeling as able. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen your goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He brought comfortable words. Our Savior Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning, everyone. Please be seated. There are plenty of announcements on page 18. I'm going to highlight a few. Uh, Angel Tree, the Angel Tree program is up and running, and there's the Angel Tree in the Narthex. And if you'd like uh, to get involved with that, there's information there for you. LifeQuest's annual Christmas Care Kit assembly is taking place on Saturday, December 4th at 9.30 the number of folks that can assemble the kits is limited. So if you're interested, it's first come, first serve, and we are going to have a, a cutoff on the number of people because the, the, the room for packing at LifeQuest's uh, office is quite small. So um, please get in touch with me. I've already had some people uh, who are now on the list come and say they want to do that, and it's such a blessing to send these kits into kids who are incarcerated uh, in an uh, here in New Mexico, and so that's uh, what's going to be happening in a few weeks. Celebration Chorale is having a concert here at Christ the King on Sunday, December 5th at 3 p.m., and you're all invited uh, to that. Lastly, I want to point out something, uh, a very generous gift given to our church because there's something that we didn't have as a permanent uh, feature is a baptismal font right here. And it is really beautiful. And so we're looking forward to uh, using it for baptisms uh, in the new year. And uh, the way we do things in the Ang world is that the bishop, when he's here for his visit, uh, he will actually dedicate and consecrate the baptismal font while he's here. That's very exciting that we're going to have new members of, of Christ's kingdom being baptized in that font. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and are bound in duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, for you have seated him at your right hand in glory and put all things in subjection under his feet that he may present them to you, O Father, perfectly restored in beauty, truth, and love. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that is precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and of thine almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion, precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same, and looking for his coming again in power and great glory. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept us our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Most humbly beseech thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son Jesus Christ and through faith in his blood, we in all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we often present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive his most precious body and blood, the Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and be, be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. And although we are unworthy, through our manifold sins, to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept us our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father, Almighty, world without end. And now, as the Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The gifts of God for you, the people of God.
The post communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory Lord, without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
recessional hymn is crown him with many crowns, hymn number 149. 